federal government, the House, the Senate, and the White House. And their first course of action to declare a new war on domestic terror or white supremacy. But what does that actually mean? That, of course, is exactly the problem. It doesn't necessarily mean anything. In fact, listen to how former CIA Director John Brennan describes the coalition of groups that the U.S. will be fighting against. Uh, what looks very similar to insurgency movements that we've seen overseas, mm -hmm. where they germinate in different parts of a country and they gain strength and it brings together an unholy alliance frequently of religious, ex religious extremists, authoritarians, fascists, bigots, uh, racists, nativists, uh, even libertarians. Yeah, authoritarians and libertarians and fascists. Essentially, he's naming every group that's not part of the neoliberal order that now controls the federal government and it controls big tech and it controls the media. So how do we push back against this? Today, we're gonna to talk to a behavioral psychologist about how to bring out your inner honey badger. A honey badger is someone who is ferocious and fierce, right? A honey badger is the size of a small dog, yet it could withstand an attack from six lions. How does it do that? It's because it is so intimidating in its ferocity. I'm Ben Swan and this is Truth in Media. Hey guys, welcome to the show. A lot to get to today, and specifically we want to focus on this new war on domestic terror that's being talked about. There's so much uh, to this story, from the way the politicians have been talking about it since the inauguration, to uh, media elite using terms like deprogramming of Trump supporters and the deprogramming that now has to take place. What exactly does that mean? We're also going to be talking about, uh, again, in greater detail, uh, this idea of these domestic terror groups, specifically authoritarians and libertarians, fascists as they're called, essentially Trump supporters or anyone who was not a supporter of the tech elites in this country and the political elites in this country. If you fall outside that category and hundreds of millions of people do, then you're considered an enemy of the state? Is that really where all of this is headed? We're going to get to all that in just a minute. But before we do, a shout out to our sponsor for this episode, Create Tailwind and createtailwind.com. If you want to be able to secede from the banking system, you got to talk to my friends over at createtailwind.com. Jim Oliver and Bob Burnett will teach you the different ways to secede from that banking system, including maybe the most important way, learning how to bank on yourself through something known as infinite banking. It is an Austrian economic principle that Fortune 500 companies use and very high net worth individuals use to bank on themselves. Down in the description below, you're going to see an interview I did recently with Bob and with Jim about how to secede from the banking system. It's well worth your time and also check out createtailwind.com today. All right, so let's go back to this issue of what is being discussed nationwide about a couple of things. One is the deprogramming issue. We're going to get to that in a minute in a, in a long form interview, but also this issue of becoming an enemy of the state, domestic terrorism, because the term domestic uh, terror and the war on domestic terror is about to usher in a whole new level of Patriot Act type surveillance into this country, monitoring people in this country. And it's not because of acts of violence that are being committed on a regular basis. There is one mob action at the Capitol that's being used as a way of, of justifying the spying on of 76 million Americans who voted for President Trump in the last election. But Make no mistake, it's not just Trump supporters who will be targeted with all of this. It's anyone who does not follow the neoliberal order. And that is, of course, an extremely important point because right now neoliberals control the media. They control tech companies. They control Washington right now. As I mentioned before, the federal government, the House, the Senate, and the White House. They control Hollywood and they control academia and the universities. And that neoliberal order no longer wants the burden of being challenged by speech, by thought, by political ideas. They don't want any challenges at all. And so the goal right now appears to be to criminalize Yes, to criminalize having a different point of view, having a different worldview, thinking differently about the world. And as part of that criminalization of being part of this dissenting group, there is now this huge effort that's being made for something known as deprogramming. In fact, former CBS anchor Katie Couric just said the other day that Trump supporters must be deprogrammed 
in order to prevent them from voting for Trump in the future or continuing to believe in the ideas that Trump espoused. Is how are we going to really almost deprogram these people who have signed up for the cult of Trump? So the talk is coming from all the corners of the internet, cable news, we're hearing about it from politicians, we're hearing about it from military leaders. The discussion specifically of deprogramming people who were Trump supporters. And I want to remind you, the vast majority of people who are Trump supporters, that Trump redefined the Republican Party in America, whether you like him or not, as the working class party, not the party of the elites, it's the working class party. And many people who supported Trump supported him on the idea of building a stronger economy, bringing jobs back to this country. That was the main thing that so many people supported about Trump. And the idea that those ideas are somehow terrorism or dangerous seems ridiculous. And yet we're hearing about the deprogramming of people across the board. In fact, I did a, a long form interview with God Syed. He is a behavioral psychologist and a brilliant guy. He's also the author of a book called The Parasitic Mind. And we talked on the RT No BS podcast that I did on inauguration day. And we talked about this issue of deplatforming and what people need to be able to do to push back against this uh, idea that there can only be one set of thinking in a free society, which of course is completely totalitarian. So watch the interview here. And, and when we get to the end, he's going to explain to you how we need to respond to this push for deplatforming by bringing out something that he calls your inner honey badger. Take a listen. What message is that sending to this group of people that you are the enemy now, not unity? Biden keeps talking about unity, but it sounds to me like unity is conformity. Right. Well, the reason why the Democrats are not happy having won all of the uh, seats of power is because the existence of the other camp is an affront to them, right? ideologues always behave this way. So I fled the Middle East. We are Lebanese Jews. And I can assure you that in the Middle East, the mere fact that you weren't of the correct religion was itself a form of incitement to violence. The existence of a Jew on the noble lands of the Middle East was itself an affront, right? So ideologues always think with that reflexive instinct of it's not enough to win. It, you have to destroy the enemy. They should not exist. Only an insane person must vote for Trump. That's why we need to deprogram them. By the way, yesterday I put up a satirical uh, clip on my uh, YouTube channel where I basically argue, where I uh, deep, uh, deprogrammed my wife. I, I showed a clip where she first said some nice things and some not nice things about Trump. That's before she was deprogrammed by me. But after I deprogrammed her, every time that I would flash a picture of Trump in front of her, she would only utter evil. I was being satirical, but that's exactly what my academic colleagues, journalists, the intelligentsia are arguing. You can't be a sane person and have anything nice to say about Trump. That's why we must deprogram you and free you from that mind virus of yours. You, the book behind you, by the way, your book, I would encourage uh, our viewers to get. It's called The Parasitic Mind. But I want to talk to you specifically about that word you just used. And by the way, I watched the video. It's it's pretty well done uh, on the deprogramming. But but in its, on a serious note, this word is being used often. It's being used not just uh, by one or two people. I mean, someone is, as well known as Katie Couric just the other day said that we need That's to deprogram Trump supporters. Now think about the, the just the terminology there. What does that even mean? When you when you're saying and I again I watched your video and and I think what you do in the video sums up very well what their thinking is. But on a serious note or for serious thinking people, how can anyone believe that deprogramming anyone could ever result in anything positive? I mean, they, they, how do you spin that to sound like it's a good thing in a free society? That's exactly why the, my book was titled, is titled The Parasitic Mind, because it is literally ideological parasites, idea pathogens that causes someone like Katie Couric to espouse the types of positions publicly, right? It's not a thought that she's ashamed to share. On the contrary, she goes on Bill Maher's show and says, look, there is no alternative way to view 
someone who actually supported Trump than pathologizing them, right? But by the way, this is something that the idea of pathologizing wrong think is something that has been found in many different uh, totalitarian societies, right? Uh, if you don't support the noble faith in the Middle East, you must be insane. You must be causing mischief. You must be reprogrammed so that you could see the noble value of the noble faith. Toxic masculinity, a term used by many of the people who likely voted for Biden, is a term that pathologizes half of humanity called men, right? To be male, to be masculine, to exhibit masculine traits is pathological. We need to remove the toxicity of your manhood. And so this type of language is exactly the type of language that ideologues of all ilk will engage in. It's, it's dreadful, it's horrible. And as someone who comes from the Middle East, uh, I'm truly disheartened to see the intelligentsia speaking in such reckless manners. The use of language is so important. As a journalist, I know words mean something. And when we constantly use language to, to demonize and dehumanize people on the other side, it's leading us towards very drastic measures. Am I right about that or am I overstating it? No, you're absolutely right. Listen, the use of language is the mode by which we communicate. Yes, some of our communication modalities are nonverbal, but we are a, 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 a dialoguing animal. And so to the extent that we can usurp the meaning of words, then we control the narrative. And so let me give you an example. Uh, rape used to mean that you know, the, the, the reprehensible, diabolical crime that it was. I mean, typically a male who, you know, usurps the right of a woman to have freedom of choice in terms of who she wishes to mate with. But that wasn't enough. So now we talk about things like visual rape, right? So if a man leers at a woman the wrong way, well, it might be reprehensible, maybe you shouldn't do it, but it's not a form of sexual assault. But by altering the language such that uh, someone who approaches you in a vulgar manner is engaging in linguistic rape. Someone who stares at you in a leering way is engaging in visual rape. You create a new reality. So of course language matters. And you're exactly right that it's dangerous. And to call your next door neighbor who is a white male who voted for Trump a domestic terrorist is not going to result in good downstream effects. And I always tell people there's only two options. Either we're going to resolve these issues peacefully through the battle of ideas, or in 10, 15, 20, 100 years, we will resolve them violently. I continue to pray for the former, but every day I fear that we're we are heading down a violent path. I think the 80 million people who feel disenfranchised today need to activate their inner honey badger. This is something that I talk about in chapter eight of The Parasitic Mind. A honey badger is someone who is ferocious and fierce, right? A honey badger is the size of a small dog, yet it could withstand an attack from six lions. How does it do that? It's because it is so intimidating in its ferocity. So I suggest that if people hold to values that they could defend in a reasonable and proper manner, then they should be ideological honey badger. If your professor says something in class that is insane, challenge them politely. If your friend says something on Facebook that you think is incorrect, challenge them politely. In other words, don't retreat, as you said, into the corners and, and tuck your tail between your legs. On the contrary, if you have cherished values that you could defend, be an intellectual honey badger. And hopefully by each of us lending our voice to the battle of ideas, we can redress the ship. Guys, thanks for watching this episode. By the way, I want to remind you, of course, big tech as part of that neoliberal order is attempting to censor everything we put out. And one way to get around them is to have me send directly to your mobile device our reports whenever they come out. There's a number on your screen right now. Send me a text and I will send you each new report as it's released. Thanks for watching.